Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Kelly Roberts. I'm uh, the president of Women in Lighting and Design, uh, and I'm really excited to be hosting you here tonight um, with our live Q&A for our Light Fair 2021 Petra Kucha presenters. Um, tonight we'll have uh, Tanya, Rachel, Marielle, Alana, Amber, Luz, and Brittany uh, give a little bit more information about um, what they spoke about, why they chose the topics they did, and then give you guys an opportunity to just ask them a few more questions because we didn't get a chance to do that when we were at Light Fair. Um, so I'm gonna just briefly bring on Lisa Reed as well. She's gonna help me co-host tonight. Um, and so as you hopefully understood, from, from getting the emails and seeing the um, registration links. We are not doing the Pecha Kuchas tonight. <laughs> um, and what we are hoping is that you've already watched them <laughs> either at Light Fair um, or the recordings that we put together and the, on the video release that we did. Um, and so we're actually just hoping to get conversation going and Q and A with all of our attendees tonight. So there's two ways that you're gonna be able to do that. First of all, go ahead, put your conversation, your questions in the chat. That's your easy peasy way. But we want this to be more of a conversation. So if you're open to it and you're interested into it, go ahead and use your reactions to raise your hand. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that. That should be at the bottom of your screen. And I'll show a little hand on the upper left-hand corner, corner. And we'll see that too. And so that's use that if you want to ask your question directly to the presenters and we'll pull you up on screen just like we're looking at right here spotlight you for everybody and make it a little bit more personal that's what we're going for so what we've done just to kick things off is ask each of the presenters to kind of reintroduce themselves briefly just remind you what their Petra Kucha was about and then answer a question of why they chose that topic to present so I'm going to pull up Tanya first and invite her to the stage. All right, hi. So my name is Tanya Hernandez and uh, I am Vice President of Government and Industry Relations at Acuity Brands. Uh, and my talk was on leadership. I, I entitled it, Let's Talk Leadership and then went ahead and went with personal leadership. Um, so as Vice President, you would assume I'm, an, I'm a leader. Uh, I've been in the industry for, uh, nearly quarter of a century. So you probably think, okay, yeah, she's a leader. I'm a leader. But I chose the topic actually, because I've been working on personal growth, self reflection, you know, over the last, um, I'll, I'll say probably five years or so. Uh, and I'll tell you as someone who, um, you know, I've managed people before, but I'm actually a, what is considered an individual contributor at my company. Um, you know, leadership looks differently to, to a lot of folks. So I chose the topic because I thought, you know, what I look at as leadership uh, is actually translatable to everybody's personal life. Um, and that's what I had to, um, that, that's kind of what I've been dealing with really over the last few years. So, you know, the six principles that I outline, which include integrity, authenticity, inspiration, enthusiasm, resourcefulness, and also empowering others. Those are things that I look to pretty much every day, you know, in not just the work I do you know, at work, but the work I do for myself, for my family, you know, my children, um, you know, and, and, and relationships that, that, that I have. So I was really excited to be asked to do this, even though uh, this presentation style is pretty nerve wracking uh, for somebody uh, like me. Uh, cause I like to have it together and this is not one of those have it together kind of, uh, kind of moments, but, you know, leadership, we tend to think of certain people as leaders. We tend to think of, uh, certain traits as being leaders. I mean, I have this thing about being tall. I'm a tall woman, but, you know, a lot of leaders are tall men. It's not the tall women, it's tall men. And, we tend to think people who have a lot of hair, and, and I know this is all silly, but I mean, I'm, I'm 51, but I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen it, that 
you can look like a leader and people will put you in, in a role. Uh, and so a lot of what people like to call like the soft leadership skills uh, aren't the ones that are, are, are valued as much in organizations, but I think they're sometimes the most, you know, most effective. So when people talk about enthusiasm, you don't normally think of, you know, does my leader have to, you know, be fun, right? Does my leader have to inspire? Yes. But even being authentic, a lot of times leaders don't feel like they can be authentic uh, because you're, they're tr trying to show a certain face. So anyway, um, I, I was really excited to be able to, to, to bring, you know, all these traits forward. Uh, there were several others I could have put on there. And, and um, but for me, and because of this was, you know, this voice of change, I'm hoping that people look at leadership a little differently. That it's not a one size fits all proposition. There are several components that, um, that make up uh, leadership. Awesome, thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, now I'm gonna invite Rachel Stoner. Hello, um, I'm Rachel Stoner. I'm a lighting designer at EXP. Um, and I've been in the industry for almost 10 years. Um, and so based off of my career trajectory, that really puts me in middle management. Um, and so that's my day-to-day -day life. And um, I, in, in contrast to Tanya, I love the Pecha Kucha presentation style. Um, that's part of what drew me to, to do this with Wild. Um, because I view it as you have six minutes and 40 seconds or whatever it is to convey so much information and just spew it everywhere, right? So I took that and said, oh, there's so many things that I feel like I could talk about, um, but then settled on one that, um, that I am in the midst of right now because I think personal experience and all of our presenters we, to some extent, we talked about ourselves. So I think that that made it easy, especially in the Petra Kucha style. I think middle management is something that is often talked about, you know, amongst coworkers, but is not really talked about from company to company. And it's not really something that upper management pays a lot of attention to. So I think that just trying to get people talking about it um, and realizing that it's a critical role. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. And now I'd like to introduce you to Marielle. Hey everyone, I'm Marielle Acevedo. Um, I am a sales rep in Portland, Oregon, um, but I have been doing lighting, uh, just designing around sales for about 20 years now. So I've been, you know, I've been in the industry or, you know, theatrical industry for a long time. And uh, when I started uh, doing the presentation, it was supposed to be a presentation about diversity and how to, um, how to understand how your more diverse workforce might have to go through these code switching processes and how that would affect the work performance and sort of their ability to do their job. And then Kelly threw this curve out a lot at, all, at us and said that we needed to own all the imagery that we were putting into our presentations. So I started taking pictures of myself to put into the presentation and it ended up being this really personal presentation about like my own code switching journey, which was not what it was supposed to be to start out with. Um, but because I sort of like had the pandemic, you know, quarantine time to do this, it was a really, really good exercise. I mean, I'm really happy that I did it. Um, but it was also very nerve wracking, right? Because I couldn't, I had to write myself the script. I couldn't deviate from it. It had to be like a certain amount of time. I tend to speak really fast when I'm nervous. So uh, there was a lot of practicing that went on to, to make this happen the way that it needed to. Um, but I really did. And hopefully you guys got this from presentation and, 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 you know, some questions will come of it at the end, wanted my personal journey to be something that made people who have gone through a similar journey feel, you know, like you're not alone. Um, but more importantly, uh, gave sort of, you know, other people awareness of what some people could go through in order to fit in within their workspace. So hopefully you get at least some of that during the presentation. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Marielle. You definitely had a very eye-opening presentation. So thank you for that. And hopefully speaking while being uh, nervous just meant you could fit more words in. <laughs> um, all right, I'm inviting Alana to the stage. 
Hi, I'm Alana Shepard. I'm the principal of Intangible Light and the founder of the North American Coalition of Lighting Industry Queers. My topic was LGBTQ plus by the numbers. I picked that because every presentation I give, I pepper it with a few statistics here and there that back up one point or another. And I figured, why not just pepper people with a ton of them? So I picked my best 20, uh, or the most relevant 20 that flowed from one to another very well, out of probably a list of about 50. Uh, there's a lot of information that I could share, but I had to pack it into this you know, six odd minute presentation. And the, this is what it was. And that's, that's, that's how it came about. <laughs> that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, Alana. Um, and she'll talk more, hopefully, about what NACLIC is. Um, I know she covered that in the presentation, but um, it's a really exciting group that um, we all need to support in the industry. Um, and I have a few questions from some people already about that as well. So we will talk more. Um, let's see, I'm going to invite Amber to the stage. Hi, everybody. I'm Amber. And uh, my presentation was about Boss Lady Book Club. Uh, which is going to turn five years old in July. Uh, and since then, I see Brittany shaking her head. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, since then, I've curated a weekly newsletter, mostly a weekly newsletter, um, that addresses the topics we discuss in our monthly meetings. And to me, it was important to share this and talk about this group um, because we're a different sort of professional group, not really what you think of when you think of, um, you know, people who are networking and it's had a really big impact on my professional life and my personal life. Um, and it benefits a lot of people who don't really fit the mold um, for business often. Um, so talking about my uh, professional journey, it's currently gotten me to Targeta USA in Orange County, Southern California. So I'm not jealous of all you guys in the, the Northeast getting all those feet of snow. Um, and I'm currently seeking out companies who want to try having their own company specific book club. So if you're interested in trying that out, reach out to me at the end. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, Amber. That's another great organization to keep following. All right, I'm going to introduce Luz to the stage. Hi everyone, this is Luz Garcia. I work with Crestron Electronics. I'm the regional sales manager for the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. I have been in the lighting industry for about five years now, but in the construction and technology industry, which is where Crestron lives, uh, for about 10 years. Um, I chose this topic because I have always been the youngest person at any of my jobs and any of my classes. Um, I graduated high school at 16 and college at 20 for my first degree. So I've always had the, the issue where I'm, or not an issue, but the situation where older people are um, my, my peers. And I've always felt that I could learn from them. So the mentoring naturally happened. But lately I realized that there's an opportunity for reverse mentoring too, especially with the pandemic and especially with getting closer to wild. There's a lot of things that women are not necessarily able to do uh, yet in the workforce and that there's groups of younger women that just feel naturally empowered to do those things. And then you see the, the general generational divide with women that are in older, older generations feel like they, can't do something and younger generations are like, of course you can, why not? Like I've never seen oppression in that sense. So that kind of led me to want to create a reverse mentoring um, Pecha Kucha. I don't know how I feel about the format because I still couldn't hit my time limits. Um, when I wait, did the live presentation, I kind of went over uh, all of them. Um, I also talk a lot. I don't talk as fast as Marielle because I'm not Puerto Rican, but yes. Um, that's why I chose the topic. I think it's super important. And my next steps are to actually set up some mentoring programs for uh, Latina women or, or Latina women um, and for, for women um, that are new to the industry like I was not too long ago. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that sounds like a great next step, next goal. 
Um, okay, and last but not least, I will invite Brittany to the stage. Hello, everybody can hear me, yeah? Awesome. Okay, so my name is Brittany Lynch. I work as a lighting designer at Clinton Associates. I've been in the industry for like 10 years. Um, and I originally did the topic of, it's well, my topic is on parenting, being a working parent. And originally before the pandemic, when we were supposed to do our presentation in 2020, um, it, I was like, oh, I'll just do something about like, it takes a village to raise a child or whatever. And then with the pandemic, it was just, everything was so intense. And I came to this realization that my problems were so ridiculously looming and large of being a working parent, having children during the pandemic, that there was no way that it was a result of all of the choices that I made. It wasn't a personal, all of my personal decisions couldn't have wrapped up to make it such an explosion of a mess of being a parent and working during the pandemic. And so that shifted my entire perspective on what was going on. So I started to dig into like the, the residual or the under the surface issues uh, of parenting and how parents are perceived in the workplace and you know getting into what is the ideal worker. And it just kind of it just kind of grew from there. And and now it's just this big huge net of all these issues that I'm sort of uncovering. And as I work through this journey, um, I, you know, I've convinced Wilds to create a committee to support parents called PRG Positive or PRG Plus. And we are meeting and, and working together to try to um, focus on these issues and bring them to a platform where we can work together and, and you know, make this a better place for working parents. So that's, that's what's up. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, I'm now going to have everybody come back um, in gallery view. And again, if you have any questions, um, please start putting them in the chat or raise your hand. You are welcome. We're going to, we do have a couple of questions to get things started in case people are a little hesitant, but we're hoping that you guys bring something to the table as well. So. Kelly said she would like this to be conversational. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with one of our prepared questions. Um, and I'm gonna ask Tanya and Rachel to maybe compare and contrast your presentations. Tanya's on personal leadership and Rachel's on middle management. And you both kind of identified some traits that um, you know would would be helpful for people in those situations. So I don't know if you've if you thought about each other's presentations and, and uh, you know, did one of you think of traits that the other one didn't or do they all kind of match up? Tanya? One of the questions that, that I'd gotten before was about um, the traits that I outlined. Are they appropriate, you know, do they apply based on where you are in your career, right? So how authentic can you be? Um, when you're right out of school versus, you know, you're pretty seasoned. And, um, and so I think that, that most of the traits have, you know, they, they're important, but they fall on a spectrum wherever you are, right? So um, I spoke about my wardrobe choices when I was an uh, engineer starting out, my khaki pants and my, my UL shirt. Uh, the golf shirt uh, that I just look really silly in, but I was trying to look like the guys. That's what they wore every day, and it was easy. Um, but I know that you know, as I got older uh, and 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 progressed in you know in my career, it made it easier to to decide to look you know a lot more feminine. You know, uh, wear big earrings. You know, do do lipstick. You know, wear. So I, I don't remember so much of Rachel's other than. I do remember middle management. I, mean, I remember there's, there's, there's a lot where you feel very ignored. Uh, and so the authenticity piece I think is really key. So but yeah. I'll hand it over to Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, Tanya went first at Life Fair and first in the YouTube. And um, I feel like everything that I come in and say is just 
reinforcing. I feel like I'm supporting her because I completely agree with every every statement that she had made and every point about leadership. Um, and I think that I delved into a little bit more on communication and communication styles and how it has to go both up and down. Sometimes I'm talking to assistants all day and sometimes I'm talking to managers all day and I don't have time to talk to assistants. So it really just, it depends on the day and it depends on the task at hand. And that's something that if I am spending a day with management and we're going over proposals or in interviews and meetings and trying to get stuff, but the um, assistants aren't aware and they're pinging me asking questions like, I need to communicate that. And that's middle management is like, they is just, I don't know, everybody knowing what's happening at all times, which is impossible. That's the other problem. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely think that part of middle management is having strong leadership skills. I see um, Lois has put in a really good question um, in the chat. So, and I think Luz also could start speaking to this because the question is, what are opportunities that young people should be looking for? And then how could someone improve communication skills? Yeah, I can comment on that. So what I learned um, most recently about getting opportunities is you actually have to ask for them. Um, because sometimes we are too afraid to ask for them uh, because of our age, our ethnicity, our gender. Uh, so you have to ask for them because sometimes people don't know that you are available for them. Um, and this is something that I learned from actually all of my colleagues are male. Um, I am the only female in my entire division um, in the management side. So I, I learned it from, from male colleagues that are allies, if you would say, where they would tell me, why don't you just ask for this? So I'm like, well, I didn't know I could. So that's kind of like quick mentoring that they have done for me um, to just teach me to ask. And I even got this job because I said, okay, what are the next steps? How can we move forward with me getting this job? I, I am your candidate for this. Um, so basically just ask for it. Um, look for opportunities um, that you don't think you are necessarily fully qualified for because you can always learn, uh, but it takes longer to grow if you just stay stuck in a place that you know you don't want to be in. Um, and then to improve communication skills, you just, what, what I would do is um, analyze the style of communication that, that the company that you want to work with or that you are in has. So I work for a company that's based in the East Coast and they are a lot more aggressive than the West Coast people are. So I find myself translating tone 100% of the time because people in New York are very direct which is where Crestron is based. And in the West Coast, people are really nice. Uh, so the translation happens a lot. Just analyze what people are trying to say and not literally what they're saying is what I would do for improving communication. Does anyone else want to answer that one from the lens of your Pachacuta? You know, I'm going to go in just really quick on like a personal communication issue, which I mentioned in my presentation, which has to do with um, how much I, I, I work on being like a perfect communicator because I'm afraid of being misjudged because of it. And I think that's something that's not just real to me because English is my second language. It's, it's something, you know, I, I see it in emails, right. Where you see how much more detail oriented sometimes towards like grammar and technicality women are than men when they're communicating, particularly through emails or, or text messages. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, my mom was, was a Spanish and, and computers teacher. So like grammar errors were absolutely not allowed in my household. And that's just something that I carry with me. Um, but I've, I've found that, you know, one of the things that has most improved my communication is to be upfront about what my, you know, uh, live, not live is, but my, what, what I don't have, right. What I can bring to the table, what I can do, you know, so it's one of the things why I always say, English is my second language, right. So like, bear with me. So instead of feeling embarrassed about it, just sort of being open about 
And, and that goes to the mentoring part as well as like, hey, you know, I'm trying to write this or I'm trying to express this. What would be the best way? Can you read this through for me? Can you help me out with this? Right. Like those reaching out are things that I do a lot in my company and people do with me too, because they know I'm a really good email writer. Um, and it goes to, you know, both communication and mentoring, I think. And, and it's helped me feel a lot more secure in mispronouncing or missaying things because English is my second language. What do you think, Kelly? Should we do a, a lightning round with Sarah's question? I was actually just gonna, gonna focus on that one myself as well and maybe throw Amber under the bus for answering first since she's our books person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look. So I'll read Sarah's a uh, I'll read Sarah's question, which was um, keeping batteries recharged is more important than ever. Uh, will you share some resources, books, people to follow, podcasts, affirmations, mantras, etc. What you find to keep yourself feeling awesome? Well, my immediate answer to that is other people. I love you know when you meet somebody and immediately the first question is what do you do. Instead of doing that, when I meet people or like talk to people for the first time, um, I like to, oh, so what kinds of things are you interested in? And like, sometimes you have to get more specific and be like, oh, I've been listening to a good podcast lately. Other people are your best resource for this. Um, I am like constantly getting text message, um, text messages from friends with articles or um, I'll get podcast suggestions. Um, I sign up for a lot of um, like magazine and um, newspaper daily emails. Um, and those always have article suggestions. Um, listen to the radio every once in a while. Um, have something come up that you wouldn't necessarily like pick for yourself. Um, sometimes you'll hear an advertisement that's interesting. Um, I still, even though this is really embarrassing, I still go on um, Tumblr and Pinterest and I'll go through and find things. And if you have the right Instagram accounts. You can find really cool inspirational stuff there. I mean, use social media in a positive way, because if you follow um, people who inspire you or, um, you know, news outlets that you trust, um, or like if you're a runner and you just start searching that, I mean, inspiration is everywhere if you look for it. Um, and another fun thing to do is ask a kid um, in your life, like, hey, what is something super cool that you saw recently? If you ever need to be inspired, like, honestly, like, I see Brittany laughing because I've asked, like, um, asking people, like, what was the last thing that filled you with wonder? Um, just keep your eyes open and you'll find, you'll find things. Um, but yeah, definitely using social media in a positive way. Um, and don't be embarrassed to use Pinterest and look up inspirational quotes because sometimes you get really good ones. I have a friend, a really close friend that has a, um, in the bathroom, an inspirational board, but she did it in an ironic way, I think, because she's not that type of person, but I love to go into her bathroom and just sit there and read the inspirational quote. That friend, um, yeah, so I, she did it ironically, but I love that board, so I go into her bathroom and I read it every time I go to her house, even if I have nothing to do. It uh, works. I like Having, um, if you find a good mantra, this is another thing that like, could be done ironically, but I love it. Um, either putting a post-it note with like an inspirational quote on it on your mirror in your bathroom or like writing an erasable marker. It's like super cheesy, like, you know, teenager in a rom-com thing, but it really makes a difference because if it's there, you see it and it's intentional and it'll ingrain in your brain regardless of, of the embarrassing method that you're using. I would say that as part of keeping batteries charged, you need to power down occasionally. Um, so I think we all need to really just take our weekends as our weekends and take our time off as our time off and just make sure that we don't forget that because sometimes it gets really hard to keep that in the forefront. And I would say self-care, of course, but I think that, that there's three, three fronts on that. There's taking care of like your physical self, you know, getting nutrition, getting good hygiene, there's self-indulgence and, you know, watching that movie, you know, sitting in the bath with a glass of wine, that sort of thing. That's part of it too. But also, and I think this is very, very important, is feeding your soul, giving yourself an outlet for creativity that is not your job. 
Um, I rediscovered this recently and it's been the greatest thing ever. So um, I've started, <laughs> it's still lighting design, but I'm designing lighting for theater uh, part-time. Uh, and I now have six shows lined up. I'm probably not gonna sleep, but I'm gonna be really happy. You know, I, I'm gonna be a little negative, uh, not negative, but like really like honest about, like for me, especially during this pandemic year and everything that has happened, sort of the way that I have recharged or allowed myself to recharge is to say, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not want to go for a run. It's okay to say, I'm going to sit in and watch, you know, I don't know, binge The Witcher while I drink tequila. Like, right? Like it's just it's sometimes escapism, right? Like I'm going to sit down this weekend and I'm going to read this entire trilogy about like a sexy vampire. So, cause that's just, that's just what I feel like doing. And my kids are not here. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, just being really conscious of the fact that, okay, I did that for two days. Now I'm going to go for a run and I'm going to make myself answer all these emails and I'm going to do all this other stuff. Right. But there's also like, I think during this whole process, there's so many articles about like how to be your best self and how to like get out of the house and how to lose the COVID weight. I'm like, I'm not going to lose the COVID weight. That's not going to happen. And that's fine. And I'm not going to be in a good mood today. And well, I'm just not going to be in a good mood today. And somehow like being okay with my feelings recharges me, even if those feelings are not what, you know, people expect them or they're supposed to be. So. That is awesome because I just talk about that in my Pecha Kucha. Like there is no life hack because this is just insanity. So thank you for saying that. Um, I would say like the way to recharge my batteries is I honestly have been really into sledding with my kids lately and <laughs> just going outside. And, and, you know, we've been doing that, um, you know, so like, and that's cool. It's different. And it's a way for me to just love them and just, you know, get away from, an event we're lucky enough that it's you know we've got a sledding hill right here so I don't I don't have to plan it I feel like as soon as I plan something for something to do for the family it becomes a chore and I have to like make sure everybody's on point make sure the kids are dressed appropriate behaving well but as soon as it's kind of like a free form let's just sort of enjoy the moment with each other which has been sledding lately it's been really great so I'm a big believer in sleep and we don't get enough of it and, uh, and we should make sure that we do because it actually affects so many pieces of our lives when we are sleep deprived. Um, and we know sometimes we don't even know we're sleep deprived. Um, and also the transition to sleep, you know, we talk about not a lot of light at night, right? I mean, but that's, you know, there, there, there's something to that. Uh, it's even having a lot of light in the daytime so you can sleep better. But, you know, it's interesting, the, I guess iPhone just did an update and, and it's got all this cool stuff on there where literally like it says I'm asleep. If you call me, I don't know you call me and I don't care, except, you know, my favorites, you know, like my family, people I, I want to make sure, you know, that, that I get that call, uh, but I'm not being, um, I'm not going to be awakened by a telemarketer. Uh, they've changed, they literally changed the way, um, you know, the alarms are now, uh, they're not the, you know, those terrible, da, 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 you know, it's, it's uh, like you can put songs on there, it can be soothing, it's, you know, and, and I think there's a lot to how you go to sleep, and how you awake, in terms of what your day will feel like, and so I don't go straight into email, I don't go straight into social media, I don't go straight into a lot of those things, I, you know, kind of, you know, do some meditation, and, you know, transition now into, now I'm going to be a badass today, but get my rest first. So I, I think rest is, you know, people don't think of it enough, but we do, we need sleep. All right, thanks guys. Uh, I see a question from the audience. So I'm going to bring uh, Parker forward. Yeah, I just, you know, talking with women in lighting and design, um, I just sort of had a general question about, um, Specific to the lighting industry, have you, any of you guys, this is to everybody, um, in your career, are there any difficulties you have faced um, specific to this industry? Um, anything you can speak on, um, especially in regards to being a woman in this industry? You know, it, it, when I scroll through company pages, which I do a lot, 
seems like a lot of times I see a lot of male faces and not so many um, female faces. Um, and then um, if you can just talk about what um, we can do moving forward, is there anything you'd like to see change in this industry? How can women become a big part of it? Um, how can sort of the lighting industry as a whole move towards um, just being more representative of society as a whole? Cool, thank you, Parker. It's a very open-ended question. So would any of our <laughs> presenters like to go first? I would like to go first. <laughs> um, I don't think that enough statistics are brought into moms and leadership because there is this kind of drop off that happens and it, I, it tends to trend right along the line of being a parent and having young children. And so I think if we brought in more information about how many women mom or how many women mothers there are in lighting design and where their positions are and to kind of compare that to the, da the data on people, um, you know, women without kids. Because if you study the COVID rates of people dropping out of the workforce, you know, like it was pretty much all moms. And then when you tracked how they came back, but you would notice the trend of like women who didn't have children would trickle back in a lot faster and track along with men than, than mothers. So I think, you know, we, we really need to bring that into our picture of statistics and say, well, why, it, why aren't moms in the picture? Well, maybe we need more support and maybe there's some bias there about what it means to be a worker and um, moving forward with that to just kind of dig into it a little bit more. That's, that's my spiel. That's actually a really important topic, I think, to understand how many women we do lose um, during such a crucial time of their growth um, in business, of course. Um, and actually, it was something I was thinking about with Luz with your presentation and wondering if there was, I've never seen any studies about women that come back to the workforce afterwards. And maybe Lisa, you've seen, because I know that you ran that big survey a couple of years ago. But I was wondering from Luz's point of view also, if there was a area to, for reverse mentoring, we yeah. now have younger women. Can we bring women who have gone, left the workforce for a certain amount of time and give them more support in reaching places yeah. lost? Yeah, I don't know. I think it all ties together, actually, because there are studies that show that women in middle management have left the workforce for up to 10 years and then come back and then live their whole lives in middle management. But they have a hard time coming back and they have a hard time in two aspects because I don't have children. And on your question, Parker, I was told by a prospective agency that I was interviewing to manage uh, by the principal of the agency sweetie, do not have children, do not get pregnant. So obviously I'm not gonna be hiring that agency, but um, for things you should not say, uh, don't say things that have nothing to do with your personal life. Um, so going back to that, yeah, there are programs because there's, there's things within like, I, I see it with my sister, she's trying to get back to work. She has a seven year old and her friends that are mothers that don't work kind of resent the fact she wants to go back to work. And then the women that are in the workforce that never left the workforce also cannot identify with her. So she lives in like a weird dichotomy or dichotomy, however you pronounce that. Um, and th there are programs for that, but it's just not ample enough. And it's not in, in our industry, it doesn't exist because there's not enough women trying to push this. And I think it's definitely worth doing so that people don't feel like they have the right to tell you not to get pregnant when you're interviewing them. On like a more micro level of like small actionable items that you can do every day, um, because this is all like these are all really big institutional problems that we're talking about, and sometimes that can feel overwhelming for both men and for women, and they need to be addressed obviously. And so sometimes like what we'll talk about in Boss Lady is like these little experiences that women will have, um, and they feel like they're the only, only ones experiencing it. Like Luz, you, you just shared this. And um, I don't know if like when that happened to you, you felt like, you know, am I the only one that's happened to? But like you find out when you share, so many people have had that experience. Um, so like small things that you can do um, 
every day. Like if you're in a meeting, for example, um, and you know, a woman is speaking and she gets interrupted and uh, you know, shares an idea, things like um amplifying is a big one because uh, a behavior that tends to happen quite a bit um is like interruption and speaking over and it's like linguistic patterns that have been identified. Um, so it's like pretty common for a woman in the meeting to get interrupted um, and then she doesn't get to keep talking and her idea never gets heard. So something small like that is like, oh, well, Amber, you were talking, like, what did you say? Or, oh, hey guys, I think we just interrupted. Just being mindful of little things like that are huge. And it actually, it's like really discouraging when things happen like that every day and they feel like they're small and they feel like they don't matter, but they do because they build up and they chip away. Um, that's the example that I can come up with off the top of my head. And I think it's great that you asked this question. So thank you. Because asking is the first step acknowledging that somebody should be asking the question. That's a big deal. You know, I kept hoping that, hoping that uh, uh, as people stayed home, you know, like as everybody went through the pandemic together, right, that, that as we went back to work, people would have sort of learned lessons from it, you know, like the fact that nobody really wants to work a 60 hour week anymore. Um, and that some of us, you know, were really struggling to balance a lot of things. And, you know, one of the few sort of plus sides, at least for me, when the kids finally went back to school was that I felt like I had some balance, right? I was working from home and the kids were in school and I had time to do other things like, you know, get dinner started. So I wasn't running around at 630 doing it. Um, and I felt like people were going to come back to work with some of that ingrained, especially the men in my office, because they were part of it. They were stuck at home too. Um, and some of them did, and some of them just completely missed the lesson, I think. Um, and I, part of what I would advocate for is, you know, we don't forget the experience that we just went through and understanding that there is a whole other part of our lives that isn't just, you know, the office and putting into place strategies that make that healthy for everybody, because I am struggling a lot with the um, sort of imposition of, okay, your kids are back in school, so you're back to 60 hours a week, right? And I'm like, no, that's that's just not the reality of the world we live in anymore. Daycare doesn't open for as many hours anymore. Um, my, my kids have different expectations of what my time with them is. Um, so, so I, you know, just sort of understanding that the world has shifted and that we're not going back to normal. We are establishing new rules and establishing policies in your company that coincide with this new life, I think. So I wanted to circle back to um, the stat somebody said, knowing the statistics um, and, and at least doing kind of an evaluation there. At least I think that's what I heard. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed is like even in a company like mine, but you know, the experiences I've had, you know, you see women in, a, they, they run HR, they might be head of finance over marketing. Um, and it's rare that they'll be head of engineering, right? The, the senior VP of sales or uh, some of the other, and I, I, don't, I don't wanna qualify them as high paying or whatever, but you know, I've always said, if they pay teachers the way they're supposed to, there'd be more men teachers. Honestly, that, that's how I feel is that men go where the money is and we kind of get left out or at least it feels, it feels that way. So I, I think that we've got to get to a place where people are looking for diverse views for every position. So just that's not to say like a man would not be great running an HR, you know, running the HR department because he absolutely could be. Um, but it just seems like that there are just certain roles and that we kind of get relegated to, or at least that that is the expectation, uh, that that's the voice. It's kind of back to the leadership discussion, you know, some of the more soft skills, the stuff that we have to, you know, that we have to really pay attention to. Uh, folks aren't necessarily looking for that point of view in engineering, which they should be. They absolutely, they should be. Designing product, you should be looking at, at uh, uh, look at it that way. Um, and I know, you know, lighting is interesting because lighting's so diverse in terms of, you know, lighting designers and, you know, uh, agencies and manufacturers and 
utilities and everybody who's, you know, all these different um, ways people do business where I'm amazed there's so many women lighting designers. I think it's great. I think it's great. But it tends to make it seem like that the women are really in charge and we're doing it. But if you go and look at where the money, because to me, I'm always like, follow the money, right? Where's all the money being made? Is all the money being made where the women are kicking butt? You kind of have to say, okay, well, maybe, maybe not. So follow the money. And I think that, I, I, I think we can do a better job by looking for my more diverse voices. And I'm talking about women, minority, whatever, for every role, because that, that voice is going to be the key to making, you know, to being successful. Um, another thing, um, we talk a lot about mentors and how when, you know, we have so many women leaving the workforce um, as they, you know, become mothers. And so there aren't as many opportunities for female to female mentorship. Um, but something that men can do, there's, you know, a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And something, you know, your sponsor is the one who advocates for you and like helps you know, put your name in other people's ears for things like promotions and, and things like that um, and help introduce you to other opportunities. And that's something certainly that men are in, often in a better position to do um, and their voice is more heard. Um, so having male sponsors um, as well as mentors, um, but sponsorship, if you have those connections and things, um, I would argue that that's a really good way to help with that. I think something that it's been talked about um, in architecture, not just line design, but in you know some other industry adjacencies throughout this pandemic is in the long term. You know, Parker, you were like, "How do we fix this in the future?" And I think we all gave, or the panelists gave, some great um, answers for immediate action. And the long term action is we have to get into middle schools of lower income different race, non-white, <laughs> anybody that's not white, and get into those middle schools and say, this is what I do. It's like a crazy, random career that nobody knows about. And really put that into middle school, high school, or younger now, so that long-term, those kids are like, oh, I know what I want to go to college for, or I know some people in the industry already who can talk to me about working at a factory or and working my way up the line or whatever. So I think that's a, a long-term plan that architects have also been discussing amongst themselves, so. Is it possible to have um, Andrew unmute? I'm very curious about his comment. He says, no, his mic isn't working. Okay. okay. Is am, I hearing, am I hearing rightly that some of these issues are related to cost and price structure of an industry, especially in terms of services. Yeah, so I think, and I was going to comment on that. What he means is designers get paid less on the people where the money are. You said chase the money, and you know gotcha. the money is usually not on the design side, pay-wise, or actually even project-wise. So we're talking about what contractors, maybe, where the money is. So the industry as a whole, there's a disparity of where the money is divided within the process of the projects. Is that what, I think that's what Andrew meant. I mean, when we did, and this is her into a different wild thing, right? And, and, but it goes to what Tanya was saying. When we did the wild salary, um, one of the things that was pretty shocking was like where people were with their salaries and the highest range of salaries were mostly in sales. And when you looked at the data more closely, most of those people who were in sales were men. Um, we didn't have a lot of contractors answer the, the, the survey, so we don't have that data, but as somebody, you know, who works a lot with contractors, you know, probably attest that that's probably true. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with also, it goes back to the time, right? Like the amount of time and effort that you are supposed to put into specific jobs and it, like the amount of personal time that that might take. Um, therefore, sure, the remunerations that go with it. Um, and I think that's that's a big change that, that that's where like my my point was coming from in terms of making a big change is where, you know, I think and, and not that just women are capable of this, but I think, you know, I'm capable of doing X amount of work in this time. It is unrealistic to expect me to work this much just because that's the amount of time that it takes you to do something because it's not the time it takes me to do something. Even though Marielle didn't want to directly say, I'll just give a plug to say that she just um, 
helped co-write an article in LDNA that was that came out this month about the salary panel and survey that we did. Um, so you should go check it out. And also, if you follow us on Instagram, we've had a couple posts that kind of dive into it a little bit more. Um, and the panel, which was really excellent, dives into some of the questions that we um, are kind of seeing come up here because money is just like a whole nother this is like hours we could talk about it for sure. And our Instagram handle is women in lighting and design spelled out, if you didn't know. Uh, Lisa, did you want to ask? Well, we had early on, Don put a question in the chat um, about uh, dealing with difficult personalities. And just, uh, I, I think Don might have been directing that at uh, others and maybe anybody can answer, but I want to hear from Alana. I mean, it, it depends a little bit on the situation, but uh, difficult personalities, I, I try to re, how shall I put this? In most cases, if it's like project specific, if it's like dealing with a problem and not so much personality or something that can't be changed, um, I, try to reframe it, reframe the issue in a way that people realize for themselves that they are perhaps not being logical or rational. So I don't get into it with them. I don't start an argument, but I find a way, and this is, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, maybe takes some learning to do or some practice, but in the course of the conversation, just reframe it so that their point of view or their course of action makes less sense. Uh, now, if it's just people, like some people just want to get a rise out of you. Uh, you know, some people just just want to just want to pull your chain. And the, the answer to that is just completely ignore it. Just talk right past it. It's that simple. You know, I found that the term difficult personalities is sometimes used as a as a way to excuse people whose behaviors is just unacceptable. Um, so I have found that most of the difficult personalities that I run into, uh, for example, I work a lot with contractors, right? So I'll have a project manager who just like nobody likes to work with. And it usually turns out that they have just learned that if they bully people into kind of giving them what they want, then that's how they work. Um, and you might have not noticed this about me, but I don't allow people to bully me. Um, so, uh, I actually end up always calling on those difficult people and everybody always asks me why, like those people like me. I'm like, because I tell them, no, that's not how it's going to happen. And no, I'm not allowed, allowing you to talk to me that way. And that's not how it works. Um, and somehow, you know, like this whole thing about like the bully doesn't, you know, when you push back, they sort of stop. Um, the other sort of, um, I can't come up with the word right now. Like Liz would say, I can't think of the English word. So that I don't sound like a moron. I just sound like I'm bilingual, um, but I can't come up with the right word right now. Um, but the other, it's a euphemism, I think might be the right word is that, oh, he's a difficult person. In my case, sometimes it just means that they're either a misogynist or a racist. So they don't want to deal with me. And in those situations, I will just extract myself from them. And so I'll have, a, for example, if it's somebody that I'm supposed to call on, I'll have an honest conversation with my bosses and be like, hey, you know, I tried this, I tried this, I tried these other approaches. They're really not responding to me. Why don't we send so-and-so in and see what happens? And if that's a really successful pairing, it sometimes reaffirms sort of like my, my, my perspective or maybe it just wasn't a good fit, right? Because they work well with somebody else. Um, so I think we need to be careful about how we dump people who are just not good people into, oh, they're just difficult. I'm Stacy. I work for an agency. And I think you know, I came into a market where previous agents had not been successful and everybody kind of blamed it on the customers. Oh, well, LA is just a really difficult market. The people in that market are just difficult. There's no loyalty. There's this, there's that. And a lot of that is people making excuses for why they haven't been successful with somebody. And in most cases, people just want to be heard. You know, they're so used to having to be difficult to be heard and sometimes just sitting down and, and saying, okay, what are the challenges that you've had in the past? You know, how can we get through those? How can we make this a better process for you so that we're all successful and taking that type of approach 
tends to help tremendously in building the relationship. Because if you hear somebody's difficult before you walk in the door, then automatically everything they do, you're going to be like, oh my God, somebody was right. I knew this person was going to be hard to work with. Oh, you know, we, we have to really put ourselves in other people's positions and really understand where they're coming from and why they got to the point that they got to, to get their job done. Yeah. I'm actually glad you said that Stacy, because I'm a believer in trying to figure out why is this person being difficult? Um, and, and so it's almost like a diagnosis that, that I, I have to go through to see, okay, um, you know, where is this coming from? And, and, and what can I do to, you know, what can I do to help? This is a fight or flight, right? Cause you don't, until you, until you actually have some kind of understanding or at least assume you have some kind of understanding, it's actually hard to figure out what your response, you know, should be. Um, I actually want to address this issue um, because I recently talked to my therapist about it. There's, you know, our idea and the way we think is the most like rational and responsible and professional way to deal with this is this question of, okay, what is going on with this person that they might be acting this way? Like, is it professional? Like you guys are saying, like, this is the way they've been conditioned to be heard that they have to be not fun to work with. You know, they can be aggressive and pushy. Um, so it could be that. It could be maybe you know that they have something going on in their personal life that's causing them to be in short with you. They're being aggressive. They're being whatever. Um, but then also you need to like hold your own line. Like there's a boundary still, regardless of what's going on with that person, you still have to set a line because if you like might be trying to preserve the peace but it might cost you your inner peace at some point when somebody is, you know, having some difficulties, they still don't, they're still not allowed to be an asshole. So <laughs> it's something that I struggle with often. Um, and, you know, I've gotten that advice and I've gotten that guidance. Dawn says, thanks. So hopefully we've given you a good, <laughs> good answer for something you can take back and use. Now that Lois had a question for Marielle and I actually had this question too, because it was something um, you mentioned that going back now, you were going to have to kind of bring your code switching back now that the pandemic was ending. You mentioned this during your Pecha Kucha. And Lois asked, how are you doing as you bring that back? And, and do you feel now that you've had so much time where maybe you didn't have to do it quite as much, that you can be more yourself? And you know, what, what else can we be doing to support you? I guess is also my question. So that's, it's, it's a hard one to answer because I'm not fully back right in the world. Like a, a lot, like Oregon has been probably one of the slowest states to reopen. Um, we're pretty, we're, I mean, most of my customers are still virtual, like remote. Um, so I, I, I'm, I still sort of have the freedom of being through a screen Though I will say that I have tried to take those lessons to heart. So I've, there's things that I used to not do because I was afraid of how people will view me because of it. I like, like my hair, right? Like there's a lot of things that I wasn't willing to do because I was really scared of how people will view me. And I have thrown a lot of that stuff sort of out the window, um, partially because I don't have the energy to go back to the code session, right? I think a lot of it just has to do with that whole, it's okay to not be okay and it's okay to be where you are. Like, I don't have the energy to go back to doing these things. Um, so, but I also have still kind of like not fully back at work, um, but I have been going through my wardrobe and I've been deciding I'm not gonna wear this anymore. I'm not gonna put this work in anymore. I'm not, you know, doing these things. And yes, I am teaching this class wearing my overalls and I'm gonna take this call with my flannel shirt on. Um, and if I wanna do my whole mohawk hair that makes me look this or that or whatever, this is how I'm taking the call in the morning because I didn't have time to brush my hair. Um, so I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> but I think in terms of support, it goes back to that one slide, right? Whereas, try to understand that that there's a lot of work that goes into a certain way of presenting yourself right and i think there's also a big divide of this between east coast and west coast right when i was in puerto rico there was an expectation of how you dress for work you know and like the coat and tie and the stockings for the women and like that kind of stuff doesn't happen on the west coast um but that is an issue not only of code switching it's also an issue of just diversity and equity and accessibility 
right? Because not everybody has the funds to dress the way that you expect them to dress. Not everybody has the 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 you know the income or the, the you know the the support group that taught them that this is the way that you do things. Um, so I think sort of breaking out of our own expectations of how people are supposed to look and sound and maybe where they should have gone to call it like all of those things is going to be an important part of us moving forward as a society and achieving true equity um, and diversity so you know I, I think to me if you know where can you support it's to sort of sit down and look at what kind of expectations do I have and how realistic are they and where do they come from and what kind of barriers are those expectations creating for people that might be fantastic at this job or position that I'm looking for? I find myself code switching a little bit uh, less so now than before. Um, but even now, I find myself, depending on who I'm talk to, who I'm talking to, my voice will change. Um, if I'm in an uncomfortable situation, I will raise my larynx and it will become uh, a, a tighter, higher resonance um, because I'm very aware of myself. If I'm in a more comfortable environment with people I know, my voice will drop a little bit like this. Uh, but before I, before I came out, before I transitioned openly uh, or, or uh, came out as fully trans, I was expressing non-binary and I was in sales in the Northeast. So I had within my territory, New York City, as well as upstate New York and New Hampshire and Maine and places like that. And I would, I would put myself together uh, in response to wherever I was going. So if I was going to a designer's office in the city, I would be pretty darn femme. Um, but if I was, visiting a, an engineer's office in Rochester, uh, I would absolutely dress fully mask. Uh, partly, partly because I was afraid of the bottom line, honestly, but also I just didn't want to make waves. Um, so absolutely. And I know, I know that there are folks out there who are doing that every day the entire time they're at work. And it just breaks my heart a little bit. So to what can we do to make it better? Find ways to telegraph that your place of work is an accepting place. So that doesn't mean acknowledging pride in June. That means posting something along with, you know, along with all the all the state regulations and whatever, you know, in your break room, something that that says that you're that this is an accepting workplace, um, you know, some sort of a pride indicator that's there all the time. Um, pronouns, uh, not not just for the sake of doing it, uh, in signatures and in our Zoom handles. It's important to do it to raise the visibility, but also it indicates to folks who are employees who haven't come out. Or who are prospective employees who might be who might be looking to join your company, that this is a safe place to be. That pronoun, pronouns are okay, because believe me, uh, I've heard of plenty of places where where telling your pronouns and your email signatures and Zoom handles is not okay, and that just makes me sick. So, you know, those are a couple of really easy things to start with. I'm gonna say just really quick on like piggybacking on Alana, like a true story. I put my pronouns in my email after a conversation through like a Zoom DIR issue and immediately got an email back from somebody in my company going like, oh, I saw you put your pronouns. Why did you do that? I was like, well, I realized they weren't there and they should be there. And that immediately opened them up to know that um, when they decided to come out to the company, they felt safe because they saw that there was at least one ally in the office, right? And to me, it seemed like something super silly. It was really important to this person. So just something that small can really make a big difference. Yeah, I mean, something that I took away from Alana's presentation was um, the numbers that she gave for the people that attended Light Fair like three years ago, I guess, pre-pandemic. And the percentage of people that, in theory, should have been non-binary and, um, right, Alana, you want to speak about? Oh, this? they're they're out there. 
they're yeah. out there. They're just keeping a really low profile. Yeah. And I'm starting to see it. I'm starting to see it a little bit now that now that we are doing these things, now that we are putting our pronouns in our signatures, it's helping. It's helping. People are more comfortable and telegraphing that that you're here for us helps. Do you want to take um, we're getting to the end of our session because we're going to end at eight o'clock. Um, do you want to take a few a minute? just now and just tell us a little bit more about NACLIC. NACLIC is the North American Coalition of Lighting Industry Queers. It's a small uh, but very slowly growing organization that is trying to do just that, just raising, just being an advocate for queer folks in the industry, uh, not only uh, trans and non-binary, although that's a big part, uh, but, but anybody who needs an advocate. So this includes because it's a thing uh, in in smaller markets, you know, even even uh, cisgender, gay, and lesbian folks don't feel safe living their true selves and being open and honest about it. And the amount of of just daily stress that creates is it's it's really disheartening. And so we're doing what we can to reverse that, being an advocate and raising awareness and. If you're interested, we're looking for people to join us. It's why don't you yeah. throw um, either the website or a way that they can reach out to you in the chat? Yeah, um, and we can also send it via red um, to everyone who registered as well. Um, yeah, and now I think I'd also like to just ask Amber if she'd like to speak about Boss Lady as well. Uh, so, just questions um, if there is any sort of experience that you've had um, professionally or personally that you don't really feel like you have a um, venue to speak about or a safe space to talk about things or um, if you're just interested in connecting with people in a, a different way than you might typically professionally or if things are um, getting back to normal as far as like networking events in your city but you don't feel comfortable going out yet. Basically, if you're seeking some sort of community or you want some of that inspiration we were talking about lately, um, please sign up for the Boss Lady newsletter. Um, that's a way to participate and get involved um, without actually actively having to do anything if you don't have a bandwidth for it. Um, we I send out links in our newsletter in our newsletters that have to do with things that we have talked about, things that we're going to talk about with our new book. Um, and even just reading that, um, might give you an idea. Um, maybe it'll put words to some feelings that you've been having that you didn't know that other people were wanting to discuss. Um, and you know, you'll you'll see what kind of community there is and how you might benefit from it. Um, and you'll get some strong connections and find a lot of supportive people in different parts of their career um, than where you are in. And if you can join the meeting that we do once a month, it would be really great to see you. And I'll just throw out there that even if you can't read the book, you can still go to the meeting, which is what I'm doing this month. <laughs> yeah, we're making the homework. Delivery. Not everybody likes to read, not everybody has time to read, and maybe you don't like the book we're reading, please still come anyway. <laughs> I, I've been audio listening to some of the books, but your newsletter is the highlight of my week when you send it weekly and I save it so that I can read it in my off time. And so that's kind of my, to, to answer the question of what you do to decompress that was asked very early on, I read Amber's newsletter. All right, yes. so as we're uh, closing out, I wanna also just invite Brittany to speak. She's got, um, is our wild leader for PRG positive as she was talking about earlier. So any additional comments on that with her lovely child with her? Um, so I do want to say that uh, PRG Positive is, we want to be an example for other design consultants to follow when it comes to advocating and supporting working parents. And we have a lot of goals to try to achieve that. But if this is something that interests you, if you want to know how to advocate, if you want to know how to be a parent and do professional development at the same time, what does that look like? Uh, definitely please you know, sign up. For now, if you're interested in being part of the committee, right, the planning committee for sure, then you should just reach out to Wild. 
and to Brittany and we'll get you part of it. And then very soon um, we'll put together something where you can sign up and just be part of the, the group as is. Um, just wanna thank everybody for coming. Really again, wanna do a huge thank you to our presenters. Thank you for being here for tonight. Thank you for doing all of your Pecha Kuchas. We know it was a lot of time. It was a lot of energy on your part. So we really thank you for that. Um, if you have any additional questions or you want to get in contact with any of these wonderful women, just reach out to womeninlightingdesign at gmail.com and I'll send you their way. So thank you for coming.